Hey everyone, welcome back to F110 Autonomous Racing. This video is uh, about a different approach towards uh, racing or navigating in particular. So previously in your assignment, you all attempted a pretty straightforward algorithm called wall following, which is essentially tracing the left or the right hand side boundaries using a, a 2D type scanner LIDAR. Um, in this video, I'm going to describe a slightly alternate a way of doing the same thing, basically going around the, the track, uh, but instead of just tracing the profile of one of the boundaries or both the left and the right boundaries, we are more interested in navigating in the track while avoiding crashing into any kind of static obstacles. And so that algorithm, as the title suggests, is called follow the gap. So it's going to be a short video, but I want to talk to you about how follow the gap works and what is the intuition behind uh, setting up that algorithm for your F110 autonomous race car. All right, so, so we begin our analysis by, by presenting a, a much more challenging track, right? So the one that is shown on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this slide, uh, this is similar to the uh, F110 autonomous racing track in the simulator. But as you can see, there's a variety of different static obstacles that have been introduced in the path of the car. Uh, so, so no longer will your naive approach of just tracing the left or the right hand side boundary uh, is going to be efficient in navigating around. You might still get the car to avoid some of these obstacles by just tracing the profile of the, of the boundaries. But I hope it's clear that you know this is very challenging for your wall following algorithm. So especially you see, you know, if we are following the right hand wall, there are challenges which are not even the same shape every time. And there are gaps within those uh, sort of consecutive obstacles. So your car might actually try to go inside one of these gaps if it's just following the right hand wall. Uh, similarly, if you're just following the left hand wall naively, there are parts of the course where, you know, there's obstacles both on the left and the right hand side. So you have to make a decision to turn either ways and uh, you need an algorithm that can actually avoid colliding into each of those boxes and go uh, sort of thread the needle, you know, uh, down these, uh, this gap and then immediately avoid uh, another obstacle right in its path. So it has to go around one of these obstacles as well. Uh, and so, so this is a much more challenging task. So you might ask, okay, what have we learned so far that we can apply uh, to navigate or uh, race in this sort of obstacle course, if you will. And while one way would be to map this environment using uh, any kind of occupancy grid map like Hector Slam or Cartographer, uh, and then use some motion planning algorithm such as Pure Pursuit that we will cover in one of the following videos uh, to follow a predetermined path which avoids any collision and clears any obstacles by some clearance uh, distance as well. And so that might be a good way and you know we can talk about what that could look like uh, and also what it takes is multiple steps you have to build the map using slam and then you have to do some static uh, map, motion planning or path planning and then you have to do some uh, actual actuation of your steering and velocity to adhere to the, to the trajectory that you've planned before but what if i ask you to modify or keep, preserve the reactive nature or the simplicity of wall following type approaches, which are map free. They don't require a whole lot of information about the track to begin with. And so they are reactive in the sense that you are making your decisions of how to do lateral control or longitudinal control for your autonomous vehicle, just based on what your perception data reads right now, and not really having a history of or a priori map to begin with. So what might that look like, right? How can we locally kind of make decisions to avoid obstacles uh, without having a, a full blown map at our disposal. And so that's what the intuition is behind uh, of an algorithm called follow the gap. It, there are many such algorithms, but I'm going to present one peculiar instance of FTG. Uh, and so let's see about, you know, how can we wrap our heads around this concept. So just as always, I want to show you first what follow the gap might look like. So you can clearly see that the scar uh, even though the T the PID can be can be well tuned, we can now you know also understand the oscillations of this car. But at the beginning of the clip, you can see how agile it is in terms of avoiding obstacles, both on the left and right hand side. 
uh, as well as uh, going through a gap where you have obstacles on both sides and you have to you know uh, steer through in the middle of the gap so so this is what re uh, reactive navigation means it means how can you use your immediate uh, sensor inputs to decide uh, what your steering command in this case is going to be so we will use our lidar for uh, obstacle avoidance. In this case, we are mostly doing static obstacle avoidance, but some of the ideas I'm gonna talk about today, they can also work for dynamic obstacle avoidance. And in case you are curious, is this even effective in terms of racing? Uh, let me play this another clip from a few years ago. This is one of the teams uh, which won the competition held in Portugal. And so you can see their onboard footage of how fast their car is. And notice they are not doing wall following. And you can see why I say that. Every time the car makes this turn, it actually goes straight. It doesn't sort of, you know, adjust itself because the track is actually curved. So it's not following the, the profile of the, of the wall, but instead it's doing something different. And in fact, what it is doing is wall following. And if you are able to even hear the audio that is playing along uh, with this clip, you can see the velocity of the car is also increasing and decreasing based on how sharp the turn is. So, so of course, reactive methods are still competitive when it comes to racing and especially in situations when there aren't too many other vehicles on the track, uh, but it can still deal with situations when there are static obstacles on the track. So, so the question is, how, we get, how do we get to that sort of performance that we just saw in both of these videos uh, without really requiring a map to begin with? So let's start our inquiry with analyzing an example. So I want you to look at this LIDAR point cloud. So what, what is possibly being reported are uh, distances of how far the LIDAR has returned um, an obstacle or has returned an array back. And you can think of the X axis as, you know, from uh, zero to pi, right? So uh, it has maybe uh, some field of view of 180 degrees. And we are basically uh, projecting uh, what every array or ray of the LIDAR has returned. And that might look something like this. In fact, since you are already familiar with parsing LIDAR data by now, uh, this is exactly what the range is, uh, um, you know, array in the LIDAR uh, reports. It reports the, le the distance towards the, uh, the obstacle or the boundary or whatever surface the LIDAR signal has uh, bounced back from. So if this is what we see, so, you know, we have our uh, zero to pi kind of uh, a field of view, and these are the distances that we see. Um, my question is that think about if this is the LIDAR information you see and you are not doing wall following, but you had to decide based on just this snapshot in time, what heading or what direction should the car drive towards, then how would you do that? Or how can we interpret this LIDAR ranges point cloud to make that sort of a decision is the, is the real question. So if we pay close attention and you can, you, know, you can pause this video right here and try to come up with you know, your guesses for where you think the car should be headed, I'll let you do that on your own and not necessarily force a pause uh, into the video itself. So, so let me get into you know, what might be a good reasonable way to think about what's a good direction. So first of all, if we look at the point cloud, we see there are some obstacles which are very close to the LIDAR or the car, right? So their distance is actually close to or equal to zero. And we have some obstacle in this sort of uh, angular range and then another obstacle right here. So, so obviously we won't go in, in, in this direction. Uh, so we don't want to go to a value of theta between uh, one point something and 1.5 uh, radians. Neither do we want to go to anything between 2 and 2.5. If you look at the value of the range reported between zero and some one point something value, you see that there are not immediate obstacles here, but there's something which is you know, close to 0 0.75, 0 0.6 uh, meters away, and it's a curved object. But then you see that there is an obstacle which is about two meters away or two and a half meters away. And if we can go through this gap between, you know, with the absence of any immediate obstacle, then at least we are sort of guaranteed that 
there might be something behind this obstacle which is occluded right now we can't be sure but for now it seems that there is room for the car to drive at least two meters before it encounters this unknown sort of obstacle and the same can actually be said about this obstacle as well right there's a there's a slightly wider gap compared to maybe the gap here that you may want to turn based on your current pose that you actually move towards this region of the map or uh, region of the environment not the map excuse me right so so these are some just high level ideas that given a scan we can get some insight on what the immediate environment looks like and that information can be parsed to make a decision for what we call lateral control right so we can make a decision on what should be the correct heading for the car for it to avoid any collision an imminent collision so so if you followed along that idea uh, that's basically what is at the heart of uh, follow the gap algorithm right so so let me make a toy version of the same problem let's say this is our car and at any given time this is the range vector that the lidar reports and so for brevity the range vector is just uh, 12 or 10 or 10 values however many shown here so the question again becomes if this is the information that you receive at any time step then where should the car go what should be the heading of the car so in line with what we just saw as an example there are actually quite a few candidates that you might want to drive towards. So, you know, infinity, by the way, is just my way of saying that the ray of the LIDAR, which was uh, sent in this particular angular orientation, never came back, right? So there's no obstacle within the field of view or the distance, uh, maximum distance the LIDAR can sense along this particular uh, angular direction. So you may see or you may feel that any one of these infinities actually um, is, is basically a proxy for saying this is the furthest you can drive right now, given that this is all the information I have. This direction and also you know, this infinity and this infinity are the furthest that you can drive uh, and there would be no obstacle present. But if you pay close attention I want you to think about what can be wrong if we just naively pick this infinity as the, or basically this angle or the ray direction as our uh, candidate for steering the car towards, you know, this possible um, absence of objects. So if you look at the range vector closely, what you will find is even though technically there wasn't an obstacle reported here, there's close obstacles reported in the vicinity of this possible candidate. In other words, even though this particular ray has reported an absence of the object, we need to avoid two adjacent obstacles, which are just three meters ahead in order for us to successfully pursue this direction. So this gives you some sort of an idea to compare or relatively compare how effective one direction is as opposed to another direction, right? So, so here, you know, there is an obstacle still on the right-hand side of this infinity, but on the left-hand side, there seems to be more room uh, for you to navigate your car. Another thing that our eventual decision will depend upon is that, is the angle covered between these subsequent ranges enough to clear the physical dimensions of the car. In other words, is it the case that if we continue going towards this infinity direction right here, then we will not touch either the left or the right hand side obstacle. There's enough room. And how do we compute that? Well, you can compute the, the length of the arc uh, given this angular measurement, what, what would be the length of the arc three meters away? Then that's the room you have to clear. So even though we can choose the furthest distance, it might not always be the best choice to make. And so that's why this is uh, you know, not the easiest thing to do. And there is some method to the madness uh, to tune the follow the gap correctly. So a better definition required is what is a gap, right? We are right now just talking in terms of individual rays and possible uh, sort of heading for the car, we need to define what a gap is. And so one way of defining what a gap is, 
that we look for a sequence or a series of at least n consecutive um, uh, values, each of which are at least a threshold distance t away. Okay, so, so we can define some threshold, let's say a threshold of five meters. So given my threshold, and there's a big question of, you know, how do you choose the threshold? Uh, given a value of the threshold, I'm going to define a gap as a sequence of values, which are at least three, a sequence of at least three values. Each of them is at least five meters away. So we can, you know, uh, scan this array again and see what fits the bill. Well, here's one uh, part of that range vector which satisfy my definition of what a range is or what a gap is. Uh, and here's another. Now this is not fully satisfying my description because I request for a sequence of at least three values. Here we only have a sequence of two values uh, that are greater than five. So if I was looking for a gap which satisfies my criteria as defined on the slide, then I would choose gap one. Okay, I would consider that in this view of the world for this range vector, gap one is the widest gap that is available. And so what follow the gap does is it drives towards the center of the widest available gap. Okay, so that's the algorithm in a nutshell. We've, we have many ways or many different ways of figuring out what is a gap in our range vector or what are multiple gaps in our range vector. And then we have to choose between candidate gaps and figure out what gap should we go towards. And whatever we decide, we usually go either towards the center of the gap or in some cases you will see we can go towards the longest range reported within that gap. Right, so I'll let that sell in. Hopefully, you know, that makes some intuitive sense. It may not be completely clear why it works or when it would not work. So we will dissect into those cases uh, next. Okay, so now if we go back and revisit, it makes more sense, right? So we are, we are maybe looking for a sequence of, these are very densely packed, so a sequence of maybe 10 scans, each of which is at least two meters away. And then this would become my candidate gap and I can drive towards the center of this gap. Right, and this is what is called gap finding. We have to find the gap where it means we have to you know, calculate how wide each of these gaps are. And um, I showed you a simple rule-based way to do that. There's better ways. Uh, and then you, know, you can even determine the deepest gap or the widest gap. Uh, you can define your own criteria of what you consider as optimal gap. Uh, and that would become your particular follow the gap algorithm. So the general intuition is we want to head in the longest possible straight line um, and not, and you can see why that would be better in many ways than tracing the curvature of this uh, sort of a cartoon track, right? So, so if you were doing wall following, your trajectory would look very similar to the profile of the wall. And between the start and the end point, you would have traversed more distance, thereby making it slower. Whereas, in this case, you could just drive straight in the direction of the widest gap, uh, and that should you know, get, to the, get you to the same point uh, much quicker, or at least that's the intuition. So, so given that we you know, have this rule of thumb that we will go towards the direction where we have the furthest or the widest gap available, question is, well, what is wrong with this naive approach as well? So one of the things which is wrong is, going towards the widest gap or the deepest gap doesn't tell you that you will clear any obstacles that are between you and the gap or the point of your chosen, the chosen point of your heading, right? So in this case, purely following the straight line, you will never be able to guarantee that, you know, the car is not a point object. It has a physical width and a physical dimension to it. So, so even though the LIDAR might be in line with your intended uh, heading, which is the deepest or the furthest in your reported LIDAR scan, um, it's no guarantee that the left edge of the vehicle is also going to clear this boundary in this case, for example, right? So we are not an uh, infin infinitesimally small point is what the, what the problem is with this very simple approach. Uh, 
So how, what can we do to fix this part while still preserving this reactive nature of follow the gap? So here are some ideas. Well, the first idea is what is done many, many times in all of robotics, not peculiar to F110. Uh, the problem is you have a robot. Let's say I'm representing all my robots and also the obstacles in this case by just circles to make it uh, generic because you can always find the biggest circle that encloses an obstacle or a robot. So we have a robot, this robot, uh, the circle which defines the footprint of this robot has a radius R rob. And what I would like is my robot to go between two obstacles, uh, each of which have their own uh, radius as well, right? So this is the radius obstacle one and this is R obstacle two. So while I can you know, deal with the dimensions of all these obstacles and the geometry of my robot as well, a very useful trick uh, in robotics is what you call translating everything into the configuration space of the robot. I can just inflate the radius of each of these obstacles by the radius of the robot and then get into this equivalent representation where my robot is just a point object but all of the obstacles now appear inflated by the radius of the robot itself. Meaning if I can get my point robot representation to go in between the two obstacles, I am guaranteeing that my robot will not physically collide with the true obstacles because I am ensuring that I'm clearing the obstacles by at least the radius of the robot itself. Okay, so the robot gets reduced to a point while the obstacles are inflated. So we can apply this concept to our follow the gap problem, right? How, how so? Well, let's say that I decide I want to go towards the green line, which is my uh, sort of the, you know, the uh, direction chosen, which is the furthest away or the widest gap. To ensure that I don't collide either side of this green trajectory, I can make these boundaries or make the shorter distances appear inflated to me. Okay, that's sort of the idea. So in other words, you can, you can go by the example shown here. I look at the LIDAR range vector and I notice that there, may, there will be some points or there might be some points where there is a significant jump between uh, you know, successive values of the range vector going from left to right in this case. And so I can interpret this jump as this is some possible edge in the real world, right? That's why the LIDAR was scanning 2.1, 2.2. It cleared the edge of whatever was at 2.2. And then the next thing we detect is at 4.8 or 5 or double, you know, the original uh, initial length. So even if you look at this picture, we are scanning from left to right. So this might be my 2.2. And then I clear this edge and I see uh, you know, 4.8, 4.9 uh, distance reported by the LIDAR. And so my problem is that, yes, my LIDAR is more or less like a point mass, but my robot has some physical dimension. So how can I make sure that when I go towards this 4.9 or 4.8 uh, direction, I don't run into this 2.2 object? So we look for this edges or these edges can be called disparity. This, by the way, I should say, is also one of the algorithms which has traditionally won in one of our F110 competitions. So I'm borrowing some nomenclature and slides from that winning algorithm. But let's get back to the task at hand. Uh, we detect this edge or a disparity in the range vector. And then my assumption or my mathematical trick, which is the same as the inflation radius configuration trick I shared a few slides ago is that for a certain number of LIDAR elements or for a certain length of the LIDAR uh, arc, I can set all of those artificially to also be closer to me than they were actually reported. In other words, I look at this disparity and I'm inflating it by an amount which will ensure that if my LIDAR follows the longest path, then the edges of the robot clear this obstacle. There may not be obstacles reported here, but I'm just inflating my reported LIDAR data or filtering my LIDAR data 
to have this dummy extended or inflated obstacle that I want to clear as well. Okay, so now there are all these questions of, well, how much do you inflate or how much, by how much do you extend this disparity and whatnot. So you can do this even from the other side, you know, you want to also clear this side as well. Um, the general rule here is um, you don't override closer distances with further distances. You are only overriding further distances, something which may have been reported here, I have overridden with the same distance as this edge, just so that my left edge of the robot doesn't touch this wall. And once you do this, once you have this filtered list where you have inflated all these edges and disparities, then you can choose the candidate ray or the candidate direction or the gap, right? You can do this disparity, you can do this filtering first. Then you can run your algorithm that for a successive length of 10 samples greater than some value is what I'm going to head towards. And now when you head towards that, um, that direction, you are ensuring that at least you have cleared any left and right obstacles as you are headed towards that direction because of this inflated um, disparity extender. All right, so your actual goal is reachable. There is still no guarantees, but it's more likely that it's reachable um, than in the previous case where you just picked the ray and gunned for it. Okay, so, so this is how we can fix, uh, or one way to fix this, uh, uh, this problem of running into boundaries by inflating the boundaries in some sort of a clever manner, um, just like the one I've showed you. So to recap, let me go over all of this in terms of like a pseudocode or an algorithm again. Why doesn't naive follow the gap work? Well, we may have, you know, these orange uh, points being reported as the distances in our range vector. And so we can, we know that the best way to actually navigate is between these two gray obstacles. So what you can do is you can say, I'm only going to, like, I'm going to consider uh, measurements which are reported, which are you know, more than some threshold of it. Or you can also have an, a, a, another interpretation of the threshold can be that you don't want to make decisions based on you know, just a few values. So you only consider values that are within some reported LIDAR distance, because you don't know uh, what you can't see, you don't know what's out there, right? That's another way to look at it. But let's go back to this picture. So in this picture, we uh, try to find where is the maximum gap or the, uh, you know, the furthest gap that we can go towards. So we know that, you know, this is the gap. Unfortunately, our orientation of the robot is such that if we just go towards the center of this gap, which might also correspond to these values right here. So you are looking for a successive two values which are greater than the threshold that will give you either these values or these values. And then you may choose towards going towards the center of this value, which is this red dot. Uh, so you start going towards this uh, deepest gap or the deepest farthest value. Uh, but since we haven't done anything to avoid um, this dimension of the robot or we aren't doing any inflation um, tricks yet, we can actually, uh, you know, collide with one of the left edges of this obstacle as well. Right, so, so the, this is why just simply finding the largest gap or the furthest gap doesn't work. Um, so we want to seek out this, this gap um, and it might work for certain kinds of robots like the total bot, which is a, a differential drive a holonomic robot. So what that means just to recap is uh, holonomic robots can spin uh, on their center, uh, uh, the, the center of gravity essentially, or their middle axis, they can spin around that uh, because they have the differential drive and wheels can spin in opposite direction. So they essentially have a, a zero radius turn is what they can make. And if that was the case, then yes, indeed, we can you know avoid this edge turn with a zero radius turn and then go safely between these obstacles. But for non-holonomic robots or for the F110 car with Ackerman steering as well, uh, that's not possible, right? You can turn sharply, but you cannot turn in a zero, uh, in a radius of a zero uh, meters, right? So, so, so that's why we, this may not always work. And, you know, so this, this not only are we uh, not optimizing for safety, safety meaning that, you know, does this 
naive approach and show that you never have a collision, well, we can't be sure, right? We can't be certain because we don't really, we're not really concerned with the dimensions of the robot in this naive approach. And so what we can do is the same trick as before, just uh, you know, introducing that in some another uh, or a similar manner. Uh, what we can do is, the follow, uh, is, is decide the following. Um, at every time step, we want to just avoid the closest obstacle and go towards some widest or the deepest gap, right? That's sort of the follow the gap algorithm. So we will use a very similar idea to inflation um, and let me present it first and then I will uh, go over sort of you know, some uh, uh, edge cases that may occur where this is not applicable. So once again, we have a robot uh, and you know, it gets a LIDAR scan. So what we can do is, uh, the first step is we find, um, the, uh, we find the closest point in the LIDAR and then we introduce this inflation radius, which is called a safety bubble. Uh, which has the same radius as the radius of the robot or the footprint of the circle that contains the entire robot. That would be the correct statement, right? So, so we can say, you know, uh, I'm looking for obstacles which are uh, further than some distance, uh, some, some threshold distance uh, T and then tell me where the nearest such obstacle is. And so you may uh, come up with this point uh, over here. Another way to uh, choose this is you instead of looking at the entire range vector in the entire 270 or 180 field of view, you only look at a forward looking cone uh, of, of, uh, of the LIDAR values and look at the closest obstacle reported in that forward looking cone rather than the entire field of view. Regardless, you find the, the closest uh, LIDAR point and, and then you put this uh, inflation um, virtual obstacle around it. Uh, of some radius. So we can choose some radius uh, RB shown uh, depicted by this yellow arrow. Uh, and what you do is, uh, you know, you say, okay, uh, this was the closest point. And on this point, I'm going to put a obstacle of some um, radius RB. And so what that means is, I'm going to set all the points which are reported by the LIDAR and which fall inside this bubble or the safety bubble uh, I'm going to set all of them to zero, essentially treating them as an immediate threat or an immediate collision, right? So, so in this example, that would be the purple points. So we can rewrite or filter my original reported LIDAR values with something that looks like this. So essentially I have taken the values which would have fallen inside the safety bubble and set them to zero artificially. And remember, I'm glossing over these calculations, but uh, at a distance 3.1 meters away, uh, you can determine the length of this arc, basically, angular arc, and then you can figure out which range vectors, uh, range values reported would fall inside this radius uh, RB of RB. So now I have a new um, vector or a virtual filter LIDAR uh, range vector. What I can do is in the remaining, uh, not in the remaining, in the new filtered range vector, I'm going to try and find the sequence of the maximum consecutive length or consecutive non-zeros, um, which are my free space points. And once again, I can have a threshold here. I can say, I want to find a sequence of maximum or consecutive non-zero distances, which are each of these distances are at least greater than some threshold, right? So there's a room to introduce your threshold here as well. Um, but the point is that if you do this for this example, so we get this new LIDAR and new filtered LIDAR data, and this is the maximum um, length sequence of non-zero LIDAR elements. These are also non-zero, but these are not part of the maximum sequence. Right, the maximum length is all of these remaining elements together. So now I have obtained uh, um, representative candidates for choosing a direction to which the car should head towards by doing this inflation of the obstacle um, by some points. Okay, now within this maximum length, what I do is I find the best possible heading 
between this from this maximum length sequence where best can be defined in many ways. So one way of choosing best is I want to choose out of these remaining contiguous sequence of uh, uh, LIDAR uh, values. I want to choose the one which is the furthest away and then uh, change my steering angle towards that steering um, towards that particular value. Right, so in this case, that might correspond to this particular range value. And so that would become the direction in which my robot starts to go. And then you can see as my robot starts to head towards this direction, as soon as this part becomes visible to the LIDAR, it will start moving here because the maximum contiguous length of obstacles reported would be somewhere here. So if I continue to follow these steps, I'm hoping that it will locally avoid the nearest obstacle. So your, your robot should always turn away from the nearest obstacle. And in doing so, it is eventually navigating around the track while avoiding obstacles. Okay, so in this case, this was my furthest point. Um, and you know, the, the reason why we want to also uh, have this algorithm is you don't want to get too close to an obstacle before you sharply uh, turn away from it. In fact, it's known to us, even in wall following, that the sharper your turn, the slower your velocity in executing that turn. So what you want to do is, you know, even when, you, and this is, this is sort of the uh, uh, guidance to also select good threshold values, that you want to avoid obstacles as soon as they become visible to you within some, you know, threshold three to four meters away three to four meters being um, almost, you know, um, seven to eight times a car length. So that gives you enough time, even at high speeds, to immediately start making corrections rather than waiting for you to get too close to an obstacle and then turning very sharply. Okay, so this is actually very similar to this notion of disparity. This is just an alternative way uh, to focus mostly on local obstacles first. Uh, you could even run your disparity extender algorithm that I showed earlier, where you know I, um, I look at this edge that would be reported by the lidar, uh, and uh, uh, you know inflate basically some lidar values here and here, uh, and make my car go towards the furthest point of the remaining lidar values. That was one approach. Another approach is we have some inflation defined. We find the nearest obstacle, inflate it. And then for whatever remains, we go towards the furthest point. If we keep repeating that, the goal of this algorithm, it will, it will always steer away from any nearest obstacles. So to summarize, this is sort of like the pseudo code of this uh, algorithm. You find the nearest LIDAR point and put this inflation radius obstacle around it. You set all the points to zero. Instead of zero, you could also set them to the value of the closest distance as well. Basically, you are setting it to a very low value so that they don't become candidates for uh, possible heading directions. Then in this filtered list of the LIDAR data, we find the maximum length sequence, uh, which has non-zero points. And amongst that, we find the best candidate where best is the furthest away. And then we basically choose that for this point and set our steering towards that point. And if we keep repeating that, we should be going uh, in between these obstacles. So let's talk about where this might not work because, uh, you know, as I said earlier, the simplicity of this algorithm um, has its benefits, but where it lacks is its an ability, inability to give any kind of guarantees. So this will, here's one scenario where follow the gap might not work well. Uh, and the scenario is when the track is wider currently and is merging into a much narrower track and this narrow track is not yet fully visible from your LIDAR or from your 2D um, sort of distance uh, sensor. All right, so what you see might happen is uh, your robot is here, it's supposed to turn left, but right now, um, all the boundaries, there's no box like obstacles here. So the only obstacle is the boundary of the track itself. So what you, the car sees as the, the furthest path or the furthest obstacle is actually this point, um, which might suggest that the car will actually turn right, whereas it's supposed to turn left. So the, all, the way this can be avoided is that the car is slowing down and we'll get to how do you control velocity in just a second, but the car can slow down and if it slows down enough, then 
even though it started turning towards this edge, there will be a point where it will see this narrow uh, corridor, which is obstacle free and correct itself enough in time to make this left turn and it can react quickly enough. But if it's going fast enough, then there will be this tipping point or this, this point of inflection where if you get to uh, enough right angle tilt in this particular case, then for sure there is no ray along this dimension that is shorter than the rays on the right and that causes our car to keep turning right. So in fact, the point is that if this is wide enough, the car can actually just keep going around in a circle and make a U-turn until it reaches something like this where the left candidate is the best possible further distance away candidate for our follow the gap algorithm. So it can get this locally trapped based on the geometry of the track. So we need to be mindful about how do you handle this case. In fact, let me play a video from one of our competitions. So this car is running a follow the gap algorithm. So you can see the track is pretty wide compared to the width of the car and it's going around pretty fast. The first time around, you know, it follows the profile of the wall, but it's not doing wall following. And the next time around, the student will be standing in front of the previous path of the car, forcing it to avoid a collision. But in doing so, as you see, it does this weird loop, almost like a U-turn, but then corrects itself, right? So I think it'll happen one more time. So in the absence of this obstacle, which are the feet of the student, the car sees the left-hand turn as the best possible candidate. But when the student is standing here, the car tips slightly towards the right and finds all this large gap on the right-hand side from the perspective of the car. And that's what causes us to get trapped in the U-turn. But luckily, it actually corrects itself um, based again on the geometry and the speed of the track. You can see it does a U-turn, but then it keeps correcting itself and then sees this track as the obstacle again and goes around in a circle rather than going in the opposite direction. So, so far what we've discussed is the lateral control of follow the gap, meaning that it is only telling you how to steer, not necessarily telling you how fast you are going. And so when it comes to longitudinal control, um, another simple sort of a, a approach is, you know, if you want to go as fast as possible, the, you, can, you can have your velocity be proportional to how far was the furthest distance reported, right? So if truly the furthest distance is 20 meters away, if you have a LIDAR that can sense 30 meters, then you should go as fast as possible because you are assured that there's nothing in between you and tw something 20 meters away. So you can go very, very fast. Or even when some, you know, have a consecutive infinities means there's an open gap over there. But if, if the gap is not infinity or not too far back, then you should scale your slow, your velocity down because you may need to avoid this local obstacle much more sharply. Right, so, and if it's too close, then you should also stop. You don't want to get trapped into something which is between a wall and an obstacle. Right, so to give you an example, let me go back. Right, so here your car can clear this, but can, it can get trapped here if it goes too far along. So if you, if you find that the closest distance or the, the furthest distance, or, sorry, is less than some value, then that means you're likely going into a trap and you should stop even before you enter that trap. So basically the idea is that your velocity could be proportional not to any kind of error that you did in wall following, but in this case, it could be proportional to the magnitude of the distance which was chosen as the candidate of the furthest or the deepest distance. And if it is long enough, drive as far as fast as possible, if it is too short, then just you know, uh, stop to avoid a collision. And if it's anywhere in between, it can be proportional. The proportionality could be one-to-one. -one, so it's like a linear uh, approach. So as your distance increases linearly, you get faster linearly as well. And the same thing for uh, deceleration. So that could be a good rule uh, to control the uh, 
the longitudinal aspect of the car or the forward velocity of the car. All right, and the good thing is all of this also works in the F110 autonomous racing simulator. Uh, you have the simulator and then you have the follow the gap control nodes where you can see an implementation, the car is able to avoid these cubes on the track uh, or these foam cubes uh, in a very reliable manner. Uh, and we also show our viz implementation where you can see the red arrow in just a second, I will point it to it. The red arrow in this depiction shows the, the direction of the largest gap that the car has detected at any point. Uh, and so in your next assignment, you know, you will be asked to implement follow the gap uh, in the F110 autonomous racing simulator. So that's it for this particular video and this particular algorithm. Uh, I will see you one more time when we talk about um, trajectory following and motion planning using uh, pure pursuit and RRT style algorithms. See you.